Jesus loves me, this I know.
Father in heaven, thank you for this Lord's Day and for all the many blessings you blessed us with. We, we thank you, Father, for this opportunity that we have this morning to come here to worship you and to sing songs of praise to you and to hear another lesson from thy word. We pray, Father, that the things that we say and do here this morning will please you and we can take the things that we that we learned from our classes this morning and from the lesson and apply it to our lives in some way you can help us all to serve you in a better way. We thank you, Father, for the presence of each one here this morning. Uh, especially thank you for our visitors. And we want to pray for all those that have, that's not with us this morning, the ones that are sick, all the ones that's, that's on the sick list to pray for and I pray that you'll be with them. And if it be thy will, restore them back to their good health. Well, thank you, Father, most of all this morning for the privilege that we have to meet around the Lord's table to remember the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, so very much for Jesus who was willing to come to this earth to die such a painful and terrible death on the cross so we might have forgiveness for our sins and hope of heaven someday. I just pray, Father, that you will help us all to have a forgiving heart that, that we will always be willing to forgive those who have sinned and done wrong to us. We're thankful for the church. We especially thank you for the church here at Dayton. We thank you for the elders and deacons. And thankful for Matthew and for the good work that, that he's doing and preaching and teaching the gospel. We thank you for our teachers. We pray that you'll be with them this morning. We thank you, Father, for loving us and blessing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll go to our classes now. Teachers can go first. The zero to two years old, this the nursery class. Three and five year old. The first grade through the fifth grade. Now the middle school and high school class. Young adult class. Have the ladies class that meets in fellowship room. <laughs> we have the duck class here in our tournament. Steve, did you tell everybody I was teaching today? My goodness, what a vacuum. But I guess we'll get by. So this morning I'm going to talk about the Lord's Supper. And our lesson text is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 17. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those that should be saved. This comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, and would have been shortly thereafter when the people were baptized following the first sermon that was preached. And you see what it's saying here? These people stayed together during the week, not just on the Lord's Day. They had meals together. You remember that Barnabas sold some land so that people from out of town would 
have enough funds to continue to stay to learn about the church. So with all this love we see in this verse, I want to know how we get from here to there. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Let that sink in for just a minute. We come together to worship our Creator. We come together to grow our faith. We come together to build one another up. And Paul says, it would be better if you didn't come together at all. You already know from the previous lessons, you're going to hear some more in the coming weeks. The church at Corinth was a mess. And if you think the division that was causing this problem was simply a matter, I am a Paul, I am of Cephas, Cephas, no. There was a lot of big eyes and little U's. People thought more themselves, built themselves up on a pedestal, and left the little guy behind. Verse 19. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. We know in the first century church there were some safeguards put in place. Do you remember about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 4? You think people thought about lying for a little while? But that wasn't the case in all first century church. Things were kind of allowed to run as they were. Does it bother you? Does it scare you when it says, must also be factions among you? Paul's saying, there has to be trouble in the church. I don't want to hear that, any of you. So, well, Here's what we're told. We were warned, the first century church was warned, that there would be people that came in, right? If you look in uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1, now the Spirit speaketh expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. Jude 1, 4, for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So why did there have to be these people come in? Why did there have to be these factions? Because God said so. Did God want this to be the case? Does he still want it to be the case? Could it be the case, Pat? It sure can. So it tells us that there is a reason why shepherds are selected, right? If they're to guard us, does that not tell you why we need shepherds? Does it not tell you why that they need to be knowledgeable, respected men, people you can trust? What about this righteous will be recognized? Who recognizes them? Well, God does, that's for sure. But should we not also? And how would we recognize those who are approved? By their fruits.
Oh, no, it's talking about those factions, without a doubt. But saying that there are some that are approved, and who are approved? They would be the ones who don't want to have these factions, right? Would they not be the people that are speaking the truth? The people that the Lord intended to be his followers? But the factions were causing all the trouble. And we're going to see it, I don't want to talk about next week's lesson, but we're going to see it again next week. And there's no mention here that it's specific Jew and Gentile. We know the congregation was mixed. That had to be part of the problem. But that's not identified as the problem in today's lesson. But there would be factions. And we pray that we don't have the same thing in our congregation. But if we do, we have to be prepared for it. Eleven twenty. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Does context mean anything? Can you imagine what fun you can have with this verse? When you come together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. Oh, did you hear what I just said? And it came from God's word. Does that mess with your mind? Well, consider Troas, Acts 20, verse 7. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. It's talking about the Lord's Supper. Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Without context, boy, have we got a conflict here. But think about the situation that could be anywhere, but specifically think about what was going on in Corinth. Jude 11, excuse me, Jude 1, 12. Now these are spots in your love feast. While you feast you without fear, serving only themselves. They're clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Do we ever know so much that we sort of overlook things? See, when I, when I read about Jude, I read about problems in the church. And, and for sure, I probably missed over this little context where it says, love feasts. I'm not worried about any love feasts. I'm worried about the trouble and how do you fix the problems. But these love feasts give us a little idea about what was going on even in the church at Corinth. Now, some will say that the love feasts refer to the Lord's Supper. But from what I read, these love feasts were probably common meals, ordinary get-togethers that the church did, sort of like our fellowship meal. Now, that may be correct, that may not be correct, and I can't tell you for sure either way. But the idea was, and I think it's probably pretty well supported, that the early church had common meals, fellowship meals that did not have to do with the Lord's Supper. And what had happened in Corinth, some commentators said that the Lord's Supper was annexed. You might say it was merged. My thoughts, it was swallowed whole. So what started out as a meal before worship just went right into the Lord's Supper until you couldn't recognize the Lord's Supper at all. It was not what God intended. It's not what Paul would have taught them. But that's where they were. Verse 21, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. If you see that in the Lord's church, and they call it the Lord's Supper, run as fast as you can run. You know, going back to the middle exit point, I think about Acts 2, try to see why this would kind of happen. Daily, from house to house, eating bread. So you have in Acts 2, you know, the Lord's Supper. And so, if you were eating together seven days a week, Excuse it for sure, but I wonder if that did 
and the common meals? Good thing? Surely not the only thing we do during worship. Yeah, it wasn't the only meal. I would think eight the whole time Paul was served. Daily life still goes on. But how could you pull the Lord's Supper out of worship? How, how, how could you do that? And the answer is you couldn't. It may not be the only thing, but it surely is an important thing. You just wonder how this could happen, don't you? I just, wow. But that's why Paul said it would be better if you didn't get together. Because what are you doing? What harm are you doing? Let's hope not. <laughs> Let's hope not. Verse 22. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or you despise the church of God and shame those who, do, who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. And then skip down just out of what was intended to be our lesson. Verse 34. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. If I mention the anti-church, does anybody know what I'm talking about? There are other names that can be called the conservative church. I don't know where it had its start. And I've never worshipped at a group like that. But two things are common. One is you cannot eat in the church building. And the second one is you cannot take the church funds, not money that's been collected, and our giving, and provide for widows and orphans. I have no idea where the widows and orphans came into play. We know as a church we have responsibility. But can you easily see where they might have got the idea that you cannot eat in the church building? Paul says, don't you have homes to eat in? But again, what's the context? He's separating worship from the common meal, right? And if the best you can do is get together and you're slobbering and just rolling it in and you're getting drunk and somebody else that's poor is sitting over there and, you know, they look kind of down and out and their tongue's kind of hanging out, but you have nothing for them. If that's the best you can do with this common meal, eat it at home. If you can't forego the temptation of being the big guy and looking important and letting your lowly brother look down and out, then stay at home and eat. That's what he's saying. Not You cannot eat in the church building. So what about these people that are anti's? I bring it up because I was amazed. A, a brother at, at Carnes that uh, I saw last week, he didn't even know the anti-church existed. In fact, we have a congregation here in uh, Dayton, and we have one of their members that comes and visits with, us on, visits with us on Wednesday night. Are they our brethren? They were baptized for the remission of their sins. They were added to the book of life. Is it up to us to take them out? If we chose as a congregation, elders leading, and we said, we've decided not to have meals in the church building anymore, is that wrong? If we decided and we had lessons on it and it was decided that we will no longer take 
funds from the collection to provide for widows and orphans and the Potter's Children's Home and, and on and on. But you need to accept the responsibility to do it on your own. I think that would be a lot harder. Would that be wrong? It's a matter of expediency, isn't it? When we collect and we spread these funds out to widows and orphans and needy, we don't have to do it that way. We could take it out of our pocket and do it. So these people that you would call conservative or antis, they're still our brethren, and the way they worship, if they worship with the Lord's Supper being proper, if they teach the same thing as God's word, is there anything wrong with them? Could, we could be just like them, couldn't we? Except there is a problem. It's not what they are doing. It's when they tell us what we must do. When another congregation says, you can't eat in your church building, show me that in God's word. You can't, as a group, support widows and orphans. You need to do that as individuals. Show me that in God's word. So the problem we have with these brothers is not that what they're doing for them is wrong. It's when they tell us the way we're doing it is wrong. When they bind it on us and saying, this is the way God wanted it. And they have no Bible words to back that up. So you got your lesson on antis free because it kind of woke me up last week when a brother didn't know what that was all about. But they're still Christians. And I've not been in their building, but the group today may be worshiping just fine. We could probably sit in with them. So the point that Irvin's made, if you're online and you couldn't hear him, it's very plain. The first century church didn't have church buildings. They ate and they met in people's homes. And did not those folks eat in their own homes? So it's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? To say you can't eat. Don't you have homes? Well, those people who were hosting, yeah, they had a home. It was where they were. So it, it's kind of a silly thought, but there are folks that believe that, absolutely. And I've, I've ran into multiple folks who go that way. You know, I don't know. I, I never ask. I, I actually knew a fellow that uh, came from Florida to uh, Georgia to hunt, and anybody that came with him, he made sure on Wednesday night that they were in Bible class. And we sat one night in my pickup, and he said, you'll find that I'm a little different from you. And I did not push him on the fact about the children's and orphans. Home. I knew where most of it came from as far as eating in the building, but I, I didn't ask. But for the most part, they're comfortable with being around us. We're their brothers and sisters. church. 
had a friend that's an elder in a church up around uh, Johnson City Way. He said for a period of time, he and his wife worshiped with one of these, quote, anti-congregations. Never ate a meal in the building. He said, you should have seen the number of homes that we were all asked to come to to have fellowship meals. A whole lot more than once a month. And he said, it was common for the preacher to stand up and say, okay, you just gave, but don't forget, you have to take responsibility for the widows and orphans. So it can be done. The key word is expediency. And if you're not familiar with that, it means we have a choice. God tells us on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper. Did you tell us when? Can you do that before worship? Before the, can you use it before the sermon? Does it have to be done after the sermon? Have you ever been in a congregation where the order was swapped and people got all upset? You've changed the scriptural order. Well, you won't find the scriptural order in your Bible. You're told to do it, but it doesn't matter whether it's right after the first prayer or before the closing prayer. That's the choice of the congregation. And there are several things like that. How, how do we collect the funds? Apparently, it's some time before we got here, you guys decided to go from passing the plates to having boxes. Does that change your responsibility for giving? No. Do you still have the opportunity to give? Yes. So what's the problem? Well, there is no problem, you see. Because God left it up to us how to manage that. Not whether or not we should do it, but how you manage it. And that's called expediency, our choice. And that's, the L, that's the realm that Miss Elder is talking about. God sets forth the law, God sets forth the rules, if you want to call it rules. But then, you know, the expediency, what time is the best time to meet on Sunday? What is the order and those types of things? Uh, God left the common sense. And in Acts 20, verse 7, So when did they meet on Sunday? They met, we got more authority for a Sunday night service than we do for a Sunday morning service if you look at it that way. So, uh, you know, the elders in each congregation, it may be different, quite different from some countries where they're going to put you in jail. So you kind of figure that out and uh, whether you're going to meet real early on Sunday morning or late. We were in a congregation, and I don't think any Christian likes to leave worship in the middle of worship, uh, besides everybody staring at you. That, that's not what it's all about, and you're not getting the full effect, if you will. You're not giving the complete honor to God. But we had a family in the congregation where they lived a bit away from the church building, and the husband had to go to work. So he asked the elders... Could you change the serving of the Lord's Supper bef to before the sermon rather than after? Because I can't, I don't have the time to set through the whole sermon. But that way I at least could partake of the Lord's Supper. And the elders decided that was fine. So he at least could complete that part of worship before he had to leave. So there might be good reasons to have it before or after a sermon or before a certain number of psalms. got to be careful when you make these changes, though, that you don't shake everybody up. Because sometimes that can be an issue, too. So because you have the choice doesn't necessarily mean you need to make the choice of change. Again, uh, I know when I'm sitting in the back, I can't always hear Irvin, but he's saying it is healthy to evaluate 
how and when we're doing things because circumstances change, and I think that's a very good point. And it's probably a good idea. That way we don't get so set that it's, you know, as we've done, it's two songs and prayer, da-da-da. It has to be that way. I think people need to know that uh, that's not something that uh, set in stone by God. So probably change every once in a while. It's probably a good thing. It may shake us up, but I would assume if you did it on some sort of consistency, then uh, it would In verses uh, 23 to 26 of chapter 11, Paul reminds the brethren what the Lord's Supper is all about. And my first thought is that he was quoting Matthew 26 and Mark 14. You want to know the problem with that? He could not have been quoting from those books because those books weren't written till more than 25 years later. So how much Paul was able to teach the Corinthians about what the Lord's Supper was about and why, we can only guess that he did a full job. But you could easily see, I think Steve mentioned earlier, you could easily see where they got confused, right? There's no written information about this for them to go back and rely on. We're told that the bread represents Christ's body, the fruit of the vine represents his blood. And verse 25 says, it is a new covenant in my blood. Relying on some commentators, an inner transformation of forgiveness of sin. It's totally different from what the people had known under the old law. When they're taking the Lord's Supper and they're thinking about the blood and the body of Christ, it's God's will in us being demonstrated. God never intended for man to fall. But he also knew he needed to prepare a way for us to come out of that hole that we dug ourselves into. And it's a newer closer relationship with God. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. We go to God the Father through God the Son. And that's whose death we are remembering when we partake of the Lord's Supper. And don't get confused, as some do. You know, there is actually a religious group that thinks when you're partaking the bread that you are actually eating Christ's body. That when you drink the fruit of the vine, you are drinking his blood. The American Indians rejected those people because they said they're cannibalists. I think that's kind of funny. It's a symbol. It's to remind us. It's to make us concentrate. We're told that we are to eat this in a proper manner. Another point of confusion. Why? Because there are some people that believe that I need to be right to do this. And guess what, guys? I cannot be right without Christ's blood. There is nothing I can do to be righteous of myself. And if you have to see me as righteous to partake of the Lord's Supper, I'm never going to be able to partake it. But the manner that I partake it. So how do you, how do you mess that up? Do I partake it because it's a habit? I'm used to doing it every Sunday, so we just do it. Where's my mind? Am I concentrating on Christ's death? If 
I say a little prayer after I partake of the fruit of the vine or the bread? Is it the same old thing? Again, is it rote? Or is it, I'm really thinking about Christ? That's how you partake in an unworthy manner. Anybody else got a thought? Great points. Partake of it in the wrong manner. Verse 27 says, You are guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And we'll conclude with 29. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. It, it is a sin. Is it a sin unto death? It is not an unforgivable sin. But just as any sin of our lives can lead us astray, if we are worshiping, if we are partaking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, we're going down a mighty rough path. Thank you for your thoughts.